Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar this morning for the Booth Bay Region Land Trust. My name is Tracy Hall, and I am the environmental educator at the Booth Bay Region Land Trust. For those of you that might not be familiar, our organization uh, is a land conservation group in the Booth Bay Peninsula. We have over 26, we have 26 preserves scattered throughout the Booth Bay Peninsula with over 30 miles of hiking trails on those preserves. We uh, allow access to the land for people that are hiking, bike riding, for um, lobstermen and fishermen that want to access the water. We have working waterfront spots. And we also offer lots of free events throughout the year, including this one that you're attending today. Uh, the webinar Salamanders and Algae from Roommates to Intimate Partners. So I received an email from Dr. John Burns earlier in the spring inquiring if he could take uh, a youth group, the Rise and Shine youth group, um, out onto the Land Trust Preserves for a night hike to look for spotted salamanders as they migrated and laid their eggs. And I was very excited to hear that that work was being done and um, asked uh, Dr. Burns if he'd be willing to share uh, his work with salamanders and he was so gracious to do so. So at this time I would like to introduce Dr. John Burns. He is a senior research scientist working at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. He has worked at the Museum of Natural History in New York researching evolutionary biology and symbioses involving protists and algae. Today he continues to work on symbiotic interactions including how DNA codes, the shapes of cells, and how genetic patterns influence microbe functions in the world's oceans. So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. John Burns. Hello, can, can you hear me, Tracy? You still there? Hmm. Sorry, yes, Dr. Burns. Okay, I, just, I just wanna, yeah, a little, little uh, can I, can I uh, share my screen now? Yes, you can. Just okay, set thank you. Thank you. Let's just get this going. Okay, share. And I'll put it into presentation mode here. Um, can you see my um, splash screen there? Sorry <laughs> to keep asking questions. No, that's okay. Uh, I'll just a little bit longer just in case I keep muting myself, but yes, we can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, oh, oops, I, I turned that off. Okay, uh, so I'll just go from here then. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Tracy. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here to talk about my research a little bit and introduce you to um, why I do it and, and what's so fascinating about uh, the relationships that are right here in, in your area. And uh, they actually um, span the eastern, the kind of eastern seaboard of the United States all the way down to Louisiana and up into um, northeastern Canada. Um, so it's really cool that it's a, a local thing that's got a big global attention. Um, so the title of this uh, seminar is uh, From Roommates to Intimate Partners, the story of the green eggs of the spotted salamander. Um, and I'll just get going. So a little um, quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll introduce myself a little bit more, although Tracy did a fantastic job of, of saying most of the things I'm going to show you in pictures. Um, then a little bit about vernal pool ecology, because that's really important to uh, to the relationship that I'm going to talk about. And then some evolutionary basics. So I, I want to get us all on the same page um, as to how I think about uh, this relationship that I study. Uh, a little bit about symbiosis in general. So what it is and, and how, it, it, uh, how scientists think about it very broadly, and not just in the specific case that I'll talk about. And then the subclass, like uh, there's a very specific type of symbiosis called an endosymbiosis. And that's what really makes the spotted salamanders around here special uh, in terms of their relationship with an alga. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about adaptive immunity. So that's something that, that crosses paths with the symbiosis research when we're talking about vertebrates like, sa like salamanders. And adaptive immunity is um, possibly on all of our minds right now because it has to do with um, vaccinations and, and why they work. And then I'll talk a little bit about the current directions of my research. Um, and so that's kind of just quickly at the end what we're doing now. Okay, a little bit about me. So I'm a systems biologist. 
so that's me. Uh, so I work now at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Uh, I'm not, there's a lot of oceanographers here and ocean going scientists that do this amazing research where they go out on ships uh, and they're out there for months at a time sampling in the oceans. I don't do as much of that, although this is a picture of me on a ship. I was very proud of it, but I was uh, put on this rescue suit. It's um, kind of one of the safety measures that you have to take when you first get on the ship, uh, just to show that you can do it. It was a really exciting experience. It didn't have anything to do with salamanders, but uh, I do get to go out on boats sometimes, even though I, I'm studying things sometimes that also uh, are on land. Um, so I lead a research group here at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. It's a really uh, fantastic modern um, research laboratory that does a lot of academic research and also applied research. The, the focus here is mostly on the microbial side of, of life in the oceans, uh, which is sort of the biggest part of the ocean life. Uh, the, so microbes in the ocean, for example, make uh, about 50% of the oxygen we breathe. The other half is plants on the land, like the trees that you see in this image. But uh, in the oceans, there are not as many trees. The oceans cover a huge area and they're full of tiny little microbes. And those microbes have lots and lots of activity that influence the globe uh, all around. Uh, and in my research, I think about how chemistry and genetics, so that's a picture of sort of a uh, biochemical networks, um, drive life and its interactions. So this picture is uh, a, an ocean cell. It's a, called an acantharian. It's made out of this uh, very, beautiful kind of uh, waffle-like structure. Uh, and then the golden little globules are an alga that lives with this cell. So that, that waffle-like thing is one cell. And then those little golden globs are a bunch of different cells that associate with it. So that's a type of symbiosis that's driven by some chemical interactions. Um, and then those influence and are influenced by the earth and environment. So uh, especially in the oceans, these things can have really big global influences. And then I work with uh, algae. So that's, um, it's called an SEM image. So it's a really, really close up image of a specific type of alga that lives in uh, the oceans. This one is from, this one was found in the English channel. And uh, it's really cool that you can see this one doesn't have a cell wall like, like plants normally do, but it has these tiny little scales. Hopefully you guys can see my cursor. Um, these little squares are tiny little scales that cover the body of this alga. Uh, I also study these salamanders, and that's a picture of one single green egg with a, a baby salamander inside. And uh, the green is comes from the tiny little microalgae that fill up the egg. And also protus, which is a very general term of, of um, a very diverse group of single-celled uh, animal or um, single-celled organisms that are in every environment on Earth. So it's kind of like an umbrella term. Uh, and today I'm going to talk with you about green eggs. So keep it very simple to start. That uh, it's just a, a very beautiful phenomenon where if you went to a, one of these vernal pools today, in fact, uh, you would see somewhere attached to some branches along the edges or out in the middle of the pond, you would see um, um, salamander eggs that that look something like this. Maybe you know this is an underwater picture. It's, it's very nice from from above. It doesn't look quite as nice, but the eggs are are green. And that's what caught the attention of people very, very early on. So before I talk about those salamanders, I'll talk a little bit about vernal pool ecology and why these salamanders are particularly important to the environment. So vernal pools, what are they, right? So vernal pools are depressions in, in the forests that fill up with water in the springtime. So uh, in the winter time, if you, if you went out and looked, you might see they, they might have a little bit of ice on them. They might be a little bit wet, but they're just kind of an area that doesn't have a lot of trees around uh, in it. In the spring, they fill up with water and, and that, that kind of uh, transient pool is the thing that's very important to amphibian life and some other types of um, organisms that live in these pools. But then if you went back in the summer, they'd be dried up. There's nothing there. So they can't sustain things that need water all the time. So that they don't sustain fish or um, or other kind of things that would be found in a, a permanent pond or a lake. And that's very important for their ecology, the, this kind of transient nature of the water in them. Uh, so who lives there in, a, in the vernal pool? So this is the springtime critters that are there now while there's water in these pools. 
Um, so fairy shrimp, it's, it's one of my favorite ones. They're really pretty and they're crustaceans. They're just like, uh, they're related to shrimp that you eat that you find out in the oceans. They're much smaller. Um, spring peepers, that's the little frogs you hear peeping around. They, they come out pretty early in the year and they're, um, they lay their eggs or they breed near and around uh, vernal pools. Wood frogs is a very important species. So they lay their eggs directly in the pools and they make these huge egg masses. Um, fingernail clams. I like these ones because they're also clams, just like uh, they're freshwater clams, just like the clams you find out in the oceans. They're related. I actually found one uh, this year attached to a, um, a salamander egg mass. A tiny little fingernail clam looks exactly like that, although that's not my picture. Um, then, of course, spotted salamanders are the ones that I'm going to talk more about today. They're, they're big salamanders and they're, they're cool. Uh, and lots and lots of different types of microbes. So, these are images I took of microbes. They're from soil in a forest around vernal pools. And there's, a, there's thousands of species of microbes and they all have different shapes and sizes and have different functions in, in the ecosystem and environment. Uh, why are these pools important? So one of the reasons they're important is because uh, uh, they host obligate species. And, and these guys have, uh, these species like uh, spotted salamanders and wood frogs only breed in vernal pools. They don't breed anywhere else. And without vernal pools, they would have they would basically cease to exist in the ecosystem. And that's something that that really happens uh, in places where um, where the forests or the environments are disturbed to the point where they there's not enough land to sustain the the um, salamanders and frogs, or the the vernal pools are filled in or something. You lose these species from the environment, and that messes up all kinds of other things. Um, so some amphibians require vernal pools to breed. So, and, and you see like, so this image here on the left is spotted salamanders and their egg masses. So they're in the middle is one spotted salamander. And now these things are like eight inches long. They're, they're, they're pretty big, bigger than your hand, you know, big, big as or bigger than your hand. So just to give you a scale of all these giant egg masses, that would be like, you know, you'd want to wrap your arms around them. That's tons of, of eggs. And each one of these salamanders can lay one of these little clouds of eggs here. Um, and they don't come out as a cloud like that, right? That they, they come out as sort of like slime and then they swell. Uh, they have a, what's called um, a hydrogel and it swells in the water to become this, this dense egg mass. But they're able to lay them because they come out kind of one egg at a time in a slime. And uh, wood frogs here on the right. So wood frogs also lay eggs uh, in big egg masses, they're slightly different. The, 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 um, the egg cell inside is, is smaller for each wood frog egg. And then the egg mass itself, which can be a little bit more extensive, is, is more loosely uh, packed and they tend to float on the surface a little bit more than the spotted salamander ones. If, you, if you're out there looking at them, there are differences. So why do they amphibians go to so much trouble to breed in these pools? Um, you might have heard of the big night in here in the Northeast where there's a, a migration of salamanders um, to these pools. So they, they, um, they overwinter underground somewhere below the frost line. Um, and then when the, the right cues happen, so when it gets like over 50 degrees and it starts raining, they'll all come out of the ground at the same time and migrate to these vernal pools. And their average migration path is, is, isn't super far, pretty far for a salamander, I guess. They're, on average, they, they travel about 150 meters. So that's like, um, it's like one and a half football fields uh, from where they overwinter to where they wanna breed in the, in the springtime. Uh, but the farthest ones go something like four, 400 meters. So that's about a quarter of a mile. Um, so they go through a lot of trouble to get specifically to these vernal pools. And, and they don't just like set up camp near a lake or a pond or something. Um, and then oh, this cartoon is showing that, that, uh, that we'll close roads and people will go out to help assist in places where they know these things are gonna be crossing the roads so that, so that they don't get run over. So that happens all over, like especially nature preserves all around uh, Maine and uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, Pennsylvania, New York, they often will have uh, a program to help uh, these salamanders cross the roads when, when they're pretty sure they're going to come out in a few nights in the springtime. 
So again, why do they go to so much trouble to breed in these pools? Now, if I was standing in front of you right now, it would be very interactive. I'd hope people could answer the question for me. I'll just give you a second to think about it, uh, why they might be breeding in the pools. And then uh, I'm gonna uh, preface my answer with uh, asking if anybody's seen The Mandalorian, which is a TV show that's been very popular the last year or so. Um, because the, the first image I'm gonna show you is uh, sums up why the salamanders tend to breed in these pools. And it's this little, um, little alien eating, eating what are something like amphibian eggs. It, and, it, and the main reason we think is to avoid predation, right? So when I introduced vernal pools, I said that they're, because they're transient, they don't allow like big predators to, to thrive like fish and stuff. So, um, the, the salamanders and frogs tend to lay their eggs in these pools to avoid predators that would be present in, in permanent lakes and ponds. That, that's generally what we think. In, in real life, it might look something like this. And maybe if you've ever gone fishing with, a, with an artificial frog lure or something, you know that bass and bigger fish love to eat up amphibians. So if they were, these salamanders got swam into a, into a bass pond, they'd be in big trouble. They wouldn't be able to lay their eggs. And then even if they did, those fish would eat up their eggs pretty quick. And then uh, the next question, why are these, why are, oh, I can't see it, oops. I can't see my own slide, but uh, why are the pools important, I believe is what it says. Um, and again, so I had this slide before because of these obligate species. And these species make up a big part of uh, the food web in the forests. So um, there's two places in this food web where they're amphibians. So this is a, a, a juvenile amphibian that would be in the pond and there's an adult salamander out there on land and they, they have uh, ecosystem roles where they're eating up lots of different types of insects um, in, the, in the water, like uh, bugs, uh, water bugs and, and uh, mosquito larvae and things like that. And on land, they also have the same kind of ecosystem function where they eat insects like uh, grasshoppers, things that you find on, on land. And they're also food for larger animals. And in this case, it's uh, some kind of otter I think, but um, they they contribute to uh, diversity of the forest by by providing sustenance for other animals, right? So they're they're controlling uh, insects and contributing to diversity of other animals. And and their amphibians are a huge part of the food web. So if you lose them, if you kind of filled in all the vernal pools, the forest would take on a completely different type of life. They'd be full of bugs, probably, and we'd be missing lots of uh, animals that we that we like to see. Okay, so the title of the talk is uh, "From Roommates to Intimate Partners." So, what am I talking about when I say roommates? There's classic examples from television, um, from the TV show Friends, or from more recently the TV show Community, where it's very funny to have uh, different types of people living together. Um, so the players in this uh, roommates are the so yellow spotted salamander. And that's a picture, another picture of an adult salamander. And the green alga, it's called Oophila amblystomatis. So it's actually specifically named after um, egg loving. Oophila means egg loving. And amblystomatis is the name of this salamander. It's called um, uh, Ambystoma maculatum. So, so it's, uh, it loves the eggs of Ambystoma salamanders, this type of alga. Um, the spotted salamander uh, is a vertebrate and an amphibian. And so now I wanna just uh, introduce what that means. You know, So these terms vertebrate and amphibian, you've, you've probably heard them before, but I wanna put them into context for you uh, in terms of exactly what that means uh, evolutionarily. So evolutionary basics, so now we're part three here. Some of the evolutionary basics about vertebrates. What is a vertebrate? So I want you to um, answer that question in your own minds right now. Uh, what, what is a vertebrate to you? And I'll, I'll note that, you know, I said salamanders are vertebrates. Uh, people are vertebrates. You might know that we're vertebrates too. What other animals are vertebrates and what other animals are not vertebrates? Um, and then this splash slide is from an encyclopedia, right? It's not, not very sophisticated, just showing 
a, a group, all the different types of vertebrates that, that you would current, uh, typically encounter. So fish are, in, are vertebrates, reptiles are vertebrates, birds are vertebrates, mammals, humans are vertebrates, amphibians are vertebrates, um, yeah, whales and ground hogs, all the mammals. So those are the major groups of uh, vertebrates that are out there. So we're all related because we all have this um, trait called the uh, backbone or vertebrate. So then what is an amphibian? So we know it's a vertebrate, but how is it related to all these other vertebrates? Like, is it most closely related to uh, birds or is it closely related to lizards or is it more closely related to us to, or, or fish? So where does it, where does it fit, right? Um, so I will tell you that, excuse me for one second because I, there's a, like a, oops. There's a window covering the tops of my slides. Maybe if I start again. No, hmm. I don't know what happened. I'm going to stop sharing and reshare again. Sorry about this, but I can't read my own slides. Huh, still there. Okay. Well, uh, I'll try to remember what I wrote up there. Am amphibians. Um, shoot. If I can help, uh, Dr. Burns, I can read it for you. It says amphibians are the first land animals. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, the, it's this little thing that has the, like the, the zoom controls that's like pulled down on top of the top of the slides right now. It wasn't there at the beginning. I don't know how to get rid of it. I can move it. Oh, I moved it. All right. That's okay. good. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you, Tracy. Um, amphibians were the first land animals, right? So um, that's one very important thing to note. So uh, before, before um, there were any animals on land, there were fish in the oceans and uh, in lakes and rivers probably. Um, and uh, we think that land animals uh, evolved or have a common ancestor with a lobe-finned fish. So lobe-finned fish were thought to be extinct a long time ago, but they have actually little bones in their fins they have four fins that have little bones in them that are that are homologous or, or related to legs and hands of bird, of um, animals or tetrapods is what we're called. So um, uh, the early amphibians are lobe fin fish that crawled out of the oceans and their legs got strengthened and extended so that they could walk on land, right? And amphibians we know um, still attached to water but they can um, also exist on land. And the early amphibians were, you know, quite big, like these kind of alligator looking things that, that uh, were more closely related to lobe fin fish. And uh, we thought a long time ago, or a long time ago, we thought kind of recently that all lobe fin fish had been, had gone extinct. But sometime in the 1980s, uh, they were rediscovered that, that there have been some lobe fin fish swimming around in the oceans, I think around South America. Uh, it's called a coelacanth, uh, and um, and now we have nice pictures of them. So now now they're not so um, uh, so surprising anymore. But uh, they're they're really cool looking fishes. Uh, these lobefin fish. Um, okay, let's go. On. Okay, so back to this. Who are the closest living relatives of amphibians? And I asked this. I posed this question before. Is it? Do we think it's fish or birds? or reptiles like alligators and other types of lizards or, or mammals and humans. Um, so here's a, a tree of vertebrate relationships. So it basically is structured that um, it has, um, when, when you have a, a little red ball or a node like this, things that are on one side are related to everything on the other side. So we see that fish are uh, have a common ancestor with all tetrapods, right? So that's that first amphibian. And they all tetrapods have a common ancestor there. So fish are as closely related to amphibians as they are to snakes, lizards, and mammals. Um, so where do amphibians fall into this? Oops. So there's amphibians. So in fact, amphibians are their own thing. They're not really closely related to lizards or reptiles or birds or mammals at all. They're, they're their own thing. They're, they're, when the tetrapods crawled out of the ocean, 
355 million years ago, the amphibian branch uh, diversified on its own and is no longer closely related to any other specific tetrapod group. And just to place this a little bit, um, so here's all the reptiles. So actually today, birds are considered uh, reptiles because we know that they are, uh, they share a common ancestor with uh, dinosaurs, right? So they're basically, birds are a type of dinosaur. Uh, so birds and reptiles are, are the same thing. Um, oops. And uh, mammals are over here in our, in our own group. So uh, amphibians are not more closely related to lizards or anything, they're their own thing or fish, in fact. So amphibians are as closely related to fish as we are, is another way to think about that. So uh, now another evolutionary basic, Oophila is an alga. And so what is an alga is an, our next question, or what are algae? Uh, some algae that you might've encountered are red algae. So that's like a nori, that's the ones that uh, they wrap sushi in. Brown alga or brown algae are kelps and we have lots of brown algae around here. They're the ones that have, um, that have uh, the bladders. And, uh, and actually there's uh, kelp farming going on here on the coast of Maine, which is really exciting. Um, and then green alga, uh, which is related to the, the one that lives with the salamanders. And they're all very, very different. So the, these algae, these three groups of algae that I'm, um, showing here are all very, very distantly related. They're much more distantly related than any of the animals that I showed you before are. Like they're more distantly related than um, fish are to, to us, for example. And then uh, microalgae. So the, the oophila is a microalgae. It's only about 10 microns across. Uh, so it's a really tiny thing. And microalgae themselves, so those were mac those examples I was showing you were macroalgae. They're the big ones that we can see and touch. Microalgae are in all water uh, bodies and they're, they have all different types of shapes. So these spirally looking ones are, are actually cyanobacteria. So we consider them algae, although they're from a different branch of life. Um, and then all different other kinds of algae. These are types of diatoms, these little square looking things. Uh, and they're also very dynamic. So uh, these videos that I'm about to play are from a friend of mine that I used to work with at the museum who's now in, in the UK. And she has a website, pondlife, pondlife.com. And I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, and she takes videos of things that she can find in local, local water supplies. So these ones in fact were, came from uh, the ponds in Central Park, New York City. So not a very exotic um, environment at all but it has these really beautiful algae all over the place. And you see all the different types of shapes they have. These uh, balls of algae, they're vulvacine algae, and then these little ones swimming around. They're also photosynthetic algae that, that swim. And these balls of algae can move pretty well. These ones over here that look like uh, dancing spaceships are dinoflagellates. They're uh, another type of algae, not closely related to these green ones, but they have uh, chloroplasts and they can photosynthesize just like these types of algae. And, and they're, I think they're really beautiful. And she has lots of beautiful um, images and videos on her website. Okay. Um, and so now let's talk about some deeper relationships because I want you to think about um, how are animals and algae related? Because we are, we, we know that uh, we all share a common ancestor of life, right? So there's um, this, this kind of blobby looking tree-like structure is showing the current domains of life as we know it. So there's three of them. There's bacteria. So that's like the little teeny tiny things that, that are covering everything. Uh, archaea is another group of, of tiny uh, microorganisms. Um, and then eukaryotes, which is what we are. We are a type of eukaryote. Um, and, uh, and we all share, we think, a common ancestor because there's we have so much in common. Uh, and the common ancestor of all life, we think, was about 3.5 billion years ago. Now, that's not a hard number, but that's about when we think the first life appeared on Earth. Um, and the next number I want to point out is uh, when did eukaryotes show up? So 3.5 billion years ago, all we had were bacteria and, and archaea at some point in there. I, I don't actually know the origins of uh, 
separately when, when they might have both originated. But eukaryotes came, certainly came later than both bacteria and archaea. So about 1.5 billion years later, eukaryotes showed up uh, in the mix. So eukaryotes that are cells, they were, they were definitely single cells back then, but they were much more, they had much more in common with us, uh, with our cells than bacteria or archaea cells would. So that's 2.2 billion years ago. And we're on this tree too, and I'll point it out. Um, so here's uh, plants. So oophila, the green algae, is over here on the left side. Um, so that's, that's the algae that lives with the salamanders. It's a green algae. Uh, and we're here in the animal, little tiny animal branch that covers every single animal you could think of. So 1.5 billion years ago, approximately, uh, we, sure, we think we share a common ancestor with algae. So that's, that's how far back you go and, and when we're the same. Um, and then some other little relationships on here. So plants like grasses and trees and green algae like the oophila, the little swimming green alga have a common ancestor 983 million years ago. So they're actually they're quite different, right? They're a billion years apart, way more farther apart than a fish and a human. Um, and another relationship I like to point out here is that this is something we, we learned in the 1980s, so we haven't known it for that long, uh, that animals and fungi, animals and mushrooms, share a common ancestor uh, that is much uh, closer than we are to many other types of life. So uh, we, can, we can join animals and fungi uh, in time a lot closer than we could like animals and plants, which is, it's only, it blew my mind when I learned it the first time. Okay, so back to our story about the green eggs. Uh, what room do the salamander and alga share? It's eggs, right? So they, they share eggs. That's the room. And if you look at this little video, is it playing? Um, you'll see at the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little green. Uh, so this is a time-lapse video of this egg as it's developing. And there's a little green hue that kind of vanishes and it looks like the, the little egg chomped it up, right? But that, that's not exactly what happened. It's more that the algae were concentrated right there and then they dispersed throughout the egg so you can't see the green color anymore. But uh, they're all trapped inside this, this little, little uh, globular egg. So now let's talk about symbiosis. So now we know who the partners are. We know how they're related evolutionarily, which is really not very closely related at all. Um, and now we're gonna talk about what it means for them to live together. So these spotted salamander eggs fill up with algae. So uh, if you picked them out right when they were laid, they would be either these colorless, uh, colorless mass of eggs with uh, this black dot that's a single cell that will develop into a salamander later, or these kind of cloud, white cloudy looking ones. So they're the same type of salamander. We don't actually know why some of them are look like little clouds and some of them are clear, but both types fill up with algae over time. So then you get these really green eggs with, with little tadpoles inside. That's the developed salamander. So this little ball becomes this little salamander over time. So this, a symb and that's a symbiosis. A symbiosis is an interaction between two different organisms living in close physical association. So it just means that, that any two things that, that live close together and rely on one another somehow so some examples are uh, corals. So if you saw uh, these, if you've ever seen a beautiful image of a coral reef, the colors in those corals come from the algae that live inside the coral polyps, which are animal bodies. So the clear parts of this polyp are the animal body. And then this, um, these little greenish brown streaks are an algae. It's a type of dinoflagellate, like that little spiky spaceship um, that lives inside the animal cells of a coral. And that's what gives them their color. And that's what allows them to live um, out there in the ocean waters where there's not a lot of nutrients. Um, and then this acantharium that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, another type of symbiosis, not, not a cell-cell symbiosis, might be something like, these are called mermetic, mermetic uh, beetles. So these little orange beetles that live inside uh, ant colonies. So they basically use chemical cues to trick the ants into thinking that they're ants. And they kind of just, lounge around and, and take advantage of all the hard work the ants do. Um, and then um, there's something called the rhizosphere. So in, in soils, if you have a, a little baby tree like this, underground there's a, a huge network of fungi and microbes that are um, 
that are helping this plant to get nutrients and extract them out of the soil. So it, it can't really do it all itself. It relies on the rhizosphere, which is a type of symbiosis in the soil that, um, that um, helps plants to grow. Um, and then in the broadest sense, things like parasites are also a type of symbiosis. So it, it would, sometimes we, we call it an abiosis or, or paras, parasitism, but in, in the broadest sense of the word, there are also a symbiosis where, and this is an example of a, a fungal parasite that's been infecting amphibians. It's called uh, BD disease. I, I can't even pronounce the full scientific name um, and I won't try right now, um, but it, it's like a, a plague on amphibians right now and it's, it's global and it's a really big problem and it might be causing extinctions of, of different species of amphibian over the, across the world. The spotted salamanders are not particularly susceptible to it, so thankfully. Um, and of course, the salamander algal symbiosis. Um, a little historical note that the, the word symbiosis hasn't been around forever. It was coined in 1877 by Anton de Barry, or um, yeah, and then I think first published in 1879. And he was using it to um, he was using it to describe lichens. So you see this type of lichen locally on on trees all over the place. A lichen is actually a symbiosis between alga. This is uh, the green balls here are algae. This is false colored, and the the hyphae here, these little stringy looking bits, are a fungus uh, that that live together to form these lichens that can grow on nearly any surface. Right. So they're using their their combined powers to the fungi to extract nutrients from the substrate that it lives on and the algae to, to make energy from sunlight. Uh, and that's, that's, that was the first time this, this word was used, 1877 and then 1879 really embedded into the scientific literature. Um, and then uh, the first time these spotted salamander eggs were described in scientific literature was by a naturalist named Henry Orr, 1888, only nine years after that word symbiosis first appeared in the scientific literature. So he's really, I really like the way um, he coined, he, he, he adapted the term for what he was observing out there in vernal pools when he was just going around for walks. And, he, and he, the things he thought about are things that we're still struggling with today. So I'm gonna read this quote from him. It says, the developing eggs of this species of amblystoma seem to present a remarkable case of symbiosis. I have not discovered how the algae enter the membrane, nor what physiological effect they have on the respiration of the embryo, but it seems probable that in this latter respect, they may have an important influence. So what he's saying is he has no idea how the algae get into the eggs. And in fact, today we still don't know how they get there. It's, it's pretty baffling. Um, they, they can't get through the egg membrane. They can't swim through it on their own. So we think that it might have something to do with the the mother salamander, but we haven't discovered how that happens yet. Um, we know now a little bit about the physiological effect they have on the respiration. So that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, uh, so he was right there and, uh, and now we know more about that. And then we've discovered a lot of more interesting things um, since then. And I'll talk a little bit about those too. Okay, why do symbioses occur? Um, so one of the big reasons is nutrient and energy transfer. So for example, for the, um, the corals, they're getting from their, their animals, like animal here from the Muppets, they're getting from their symbiont sugars mostly, but they also might get uh, different types of amino acids, the things that their body and animal bodies can't make. Right? So there's something called essential amino acids. If you ever heard a nutritionist say, you need to get more of the essential amino acids in your diet. Um, that's because our bodies can't make them, but we absolutely need them. So we have to get them from our food. And another way to get them is through symbiosis. Um, and then what about the salamander algal symbiosis specifically? Are they getting, is the salamander getting amino acids or, or energy? Um, and I'm gonna say, it doesn't seem like they are getting those types of things from the, from the algae, uh, but they do get this from the salamander perspective, they get perspective, they get oxygen. So photosynthesis, one of the byproducts of it is oxygen. And that's what puts oxygen into the air the oxygen that we breathe and, and we use for respiration. Uh, salamanders need it too. Um, and in those eggs, those big, those egg masses that I've showed you a few pictures of, uh, when they're deep down there within the egg, so these numbers are the amount of oxygen in different parts of this, uh, this is like a little beaker, right? So they measured it in the water where it's 290 
and then they measured it inside of an egg where it's way lower, right? So the, the salamander, if you leave it in the dark anyway, the salamander is using up all the oxygen and there isn't time, it takes, the, that egg mass is so dense, there isn't time for oxygen to diffuse in for all the oxygen that the salamander needs. So it's basically suffocating inside its own egg uh, without algae. Uh, and then another the experiment that these guys did was really neat. They took these um, eggs and they put them in the dark uh, and then they put them into the light and then they measured the oxygen inside the egg. So it went from something like 36. So you follow this graph, it started down here, 36. Um, and in the black line, uh, they turn on the light and then the algae start producing oxygen. Whoa, and it goes way up. So it, in fact, it gets way past what it would normally be in the water. So it becomes hype, hyperoxic. And if you leave the light on, it gets pretty high and it stays high, as high as the algae can, can maintain it. Um, but then if you switch the light off after leaving it on for a half hour, then the oxygen levels drop straight back down to very low. So that's the salamander using up, and algae too, using up all the oxygen that they had just produced but they need it. So oxygen is really essential, just like for us, for the salamanders to complete their energy metabolism. Um, from the algal, so that's the salamander. So it really needs that oxygen. Um, from the algal perspective, nitrogen. So um, in water, waterways, uh, microbes are typically limited by one or more nutrients. And one of the limiting ones on land is nitrogen. They don't get enough nitrogen. And you might think about that as, as fertilizers, right? So uh, for farmers, um, they'll put fertilizers on their crop. Nitrogen and phosphorus are two of the bigger ones. Um, and the fernal pools tend to be nitrogen limited with respect to these algae. And someone did this really cool experiment where they took water from, this is from a lake, I think, but vernal pool is similar. Um, and they, they put some algae in the water uh, and then they checked what kind, of what kind of nutrient do the algae need to grow, right? What are they really missing? Um, if you, in the control, they can't grow because they're missing something, right? If you add phosphorus and phosphate, PO4, that's what they added, they don't grow. So there's plenty of phosphorus there already. They don't need more to grow. But if you add any of these different forms of nitrogen, so nitrate, ammonia, urea, and then, um, you know, any of these things plus phosphate, you get a bloom. So they really showed in this very visual experiment that uh, nitrogen is the thing that these, um, that these algae need to grow and that they're missing in the ponds. And then uh, the salamander, in fact, secretes ammonia. So that's one of these, NH4 here. So uh, it secretes ammonia as it's going through its process, uh, you know, living processes. Uh, and then this graph is showing how the algae sucks it all up. So this is ammonia consumption. So this is um, the algae sucks up all that. Um, that bar is showing that the algae sucks up all the ammonia that the salamander can spit out and it uses it to grow. So in, from going from something like this to a green egg. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the symbiosis in the most basic terms that, that the salamander is getting oxygen and the algae is getting um, nitrogen. Uh, but there are other vertebrate alga examples. So there's the wood frog with its big egg masses in the same vernal pools. It also gets colonized by algae. And then uh, this is another cool example. It's called the Japanese black salamander. It lays big egg masses and it also gets colonized by algae. And it's, it's, the algae is related to the one that we find with the spotted salamanders in both cases. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but the algae has, um, this is another type of tree showing relationships specifically of algae. And the shaded area is the ones that are related to this one, the oophila, the one that lives in eggs. And we find it in all different types, well, not all, but several different types of salamander and frog. So it's not particularly special in this case, but uh, there is something else going on in the spotted salamanders. So what is really special about the spotted salamander and its alga, and that's endosymbiosis. So that's a special type of symbiosis. And endosymbiosis means cell within a cell. And uh, two cool examples of that are, are this, it's called hydroviridissima, so the green hydra. Uh, it has a type of green alga, it's called the chlorella, that lives inside the cells of the hydra and allows it to, um, to make sugars from sunlight. So it becomes a photosynthetic animal. Hydras are animals, they're related to jellyfish. Um, and also so is um, corals and their symbionts. Um, so those are both endosymbioses. Uh, and there's lots of different types of intimate uh, photosymbioses out there in nature. These are 
Um, this is a type of a protist cell, single cell with lots of algae associated with it. This, this one has, um, it's called a kleptoplast. So it doesn't actually have the living algae. It's a nudibranch, it's a type of sea slug. It doesn't have the living algae. It steals the, plast, the chloroplast out of algae and sticks it in these structures that it makes on its body. And it's able to photosynthesize. Even though it doesn't have living algae, it, it's able to sustain the chloroplast uh, alone. Uh, this is a ty another type of ocean microbe that all the little tiny uh, dots are types of algae. Uh, giant clams have algae that they, they put in special structures uh, in their mantle where they're, that they're presenting, and that gives them energy. Uh, this is another type of microbe called the ciliate, and it's full of algae. Whoops. Uh, and then there's another acantharian, similar to the waffle one I showed you before. Um, so these spotted salamanders have algal endosymbionts. And if you see this picture, uh, the really bright glowing spot here, the algae are fluorescent. Uh, the salamander is not. That's showing you where all the algae are concentrated in the body of this baby salamander. It's a little tadpole. Uh, and if you took one of those cells out, you would find that it might have several algae. So you can see them in green here. There's three. Uh, or in fluorescent mode here, that's the salamander cells outlined and inside are three algal cells that look pretty much intact. Um, so why is this, why is this important or, or interesting? So there's something that vertebrates have called adaptive immunity. So here's our topical note about adaptive immunity. Um, uh, we have this huge a global pandemic right now, the problem, this coronavirus, that's a, that's a 3D rendering of what, what we think it looks like. Um, and we have a solution, right? A vaccine, coronavirus vaccine. Many of us have gotten it by now. Uh, and uh, it's there to help protect us against the, the virus. But how does that work exactly? How do vaccines work? Um, so in, in this case for the coronavirus, this isn't the case for all vaccines there's this new kind of thing called an mRNA vaccine. So it's basically taking the instructions to make a piece of the virus and sticking them into your cells and telling your cell to make just that single piece of the virus. Now that's exactly what your cells would do if it was infected by the virus, except that your cells would make the whole virus instead of just this tiny little harmless piece. Um, and your cell presents it to, to your blood, to the rest of your body, and your body recognizes it as foreign from your cell. Uh, and creates antibodies against it. So that's, that's the vaccination process. That's, that's what's happening inside your body. Um, and how does that protect us, right? Those antibodies, what are, what are they really doing? They don't protect us from the initial infection so much, but they have a memory, right? So uh, that's why uh, vaccinations are neat because you can take something that's harmless and then tell your body to remember the next time it sees the harmful, the harmful, the whole virus. So, hey, I remember you, this, this cell is saying, and that little bacteria there is sweating, like oh, I'm about to get eaten. So uh, I posed this question, could you vaccinate a squid? Uh, so I told you all about vertebrates and uh, I didn't include squids in there. So a, a squid is not a vertebrate. So do you think you could vaccinate it? And the answer is no, you can't. They, they have no immune memory. So they, they have a type of immune system called innate immunity. So they have some cells that can recognize things that are, are not animal but they can't remember specific pathogens. So, and in fact, the reason I'm, I'm showing this, the reason there's a squid is because, oops, squids have, uh, have a type of symbiont. So the, the blue color on the bottom of this squid is, uh, is a light that the squid makes. So it has bacteria living inside its body and they're, they're packaged in these special organs underneath that, um, that create light. And we think it's to, to make the squids look invisible if you're looking from underneath. So these types of squids tend to stay near the surface. And if you looked up from below, you wouldn't be able to see it because of the light that the bacteria was making. Um, and we think that uh, because they have no immune memory, they're able to have these symbionts uh, because it takes frequent interactions to develop this symbiotic relationship with adaptive immunity. You can only have a single interaction. You can't have more than one because the next time you'll, you'll remember it and kill it before it can, before it can adapt to you. Uh, in a squid, every time it sees it, it's, it's, a, new, it's a new encounter. So uh, it's able to create a relationship with uh, this bacteria. So could you vaccinate a fish or a salamander? So I told you they're both vertebrates. And in fact, all vertebrates have this specialized immune system, adaptive immunity. Um, so no, you probably could not, vac uh, you could not 
vaccinate, or sorry, let me say, you can't vaccinate a squid, but you can vaccinate a fish and a salamander. So here's, here's a graph of animals. Metazoans here is animals. Um, adaptive immunity only exists in the vertebrates. So that's um, mathosomes, we're a type of mathosome and agnathans. Um, but everything else in this graph, so mollusks like snails, nematodes like worms, um, uh, cnidarians like the jellyfish and um, uh, hydra and corals all do not have adaptive immunity. And, and there's examples of, of these types of symbioses in all of these animals that don't have adaptive immunity. And I think that's really neat. So even when you get really close to humans, this is a urochordate or, or, or vertebrate. So this is like, you can imagine time, right? So the closer you are to nathosomes and agnathans to adaptive immunity, the, the more closely related you are. So even these urochordates um, ha can have, um, this is a sea squirt that has cyanobacteria. That's what makes it look green. So it's a really, really neat phenomenon. So uh, just to pose the, the problem, like how, why don't vertebrates have this adaptive, why can't I have an algal symbiont? So if I got infected by an algae, uh, my body would present that algae to the immune system. Uh, my immune system would create antibodies against it and remember it, say, hey, if you ever see this algae again, kill it immediately. So the next time I encounter it, it's dead, uh, dead on arrival and it can't cause any harm or any good for me. So how does the salamander have algae in itself? So I just went on all this explanation of adaptive immunity and how um, salamanders have it and they, they shouldn't be able to have these frequent interactions. Um, and this is something that's really exciting um, to me that, uh, that a really giant in the field, uh, she wrote this book, Angela Douglas, The Symbiotic Habit, uh, saw one of the presentations I gave and she ran up to me afterwards and said, uh, uh, asking this question and she said, well, it's the exception that proves the rule, isn't it? And uh, I wanted you to think about that. Like, what does she mean by that? Like, why does this salamander alga symbiosis, the exception that proves that vertebrates can't really do this? What did she mean? So uh, the, the, the message there is that adaptive immunity is not active in embryos. So this interaction happens in the eggs, in the embryos of the salamander so that uh, it can escape the, the, the terrors of the adaptive immune system. And those algae can get in and out of the salamander as much as they want without having to worry about the salamander launching antibodies against them. So that, I, we think that that's, one of, that's why it's an exception because it's in a vertebrate, but a vertebrate that at the time that it's in there, it doesn't have an adaptive immune response. Uh, and this is just one of the experiments people did back in the 50s to show how this works. If you cut the thymus out, the thymus is a gland that's uh, responsible for uh, self-recognition early on. And you, and you replace it with a thymus from another mouse, right? And let it grow up. Um, and you give that, that, that adult mouse a graft from some random other mouse, it'll reject it. But if you give it a graft from the mouse from, that you gave it the thymus to as an embryo, it'll accept it. So it sees this other mouse as part of self. So it recognizes itself and it sees the, the donor mouse as self because it happened before the adaptive immune system was trained to recognize that. So we have here in these embryos, this intimate association, these little, these little uh, dots swimming around or algae swimming around the, the pore where that we think they enter into the salamander body. Uh, and that leaves us with this conundrum, like the salamander has algae inside it. it they kind of escape its, its immune functions. And it, it, the salamander is thinking, who am I? Am I a salamander or am I an al algae? Am I some kind of plant? And then the algae for its part is asking, am I a mutualist or a parasite? So I said symbiosis can take many different forms. Uh, some are where the algae is like providing a clear benefit like oxygen. But when it gets into the cells of the salamander, I didn't get to talk about this much. It acts a little bit more like a parasite and we don't really understand that function yet. So we have these simultaneous symbiotic modes where in the egg, there's a mutualist alga, all these little green dots. It's motile, it's swimming around, it's making oxygen inside the egg. But then when it gets inside the salamander, we're not sure, it changes shape. In fact, it loses these flagella, these things that make it move. Uh, it's immobile and it ferments. So it, it, instead of using making oxygen, it's actually 
um, making waste products inside the salamander cells. And maybe that's what the salamander cells like. We're, we're not sure what's going on there yet. Uh, so a couple quick current directions to close out. What are we doing now to understand this better? Uh, one of the things we're doing is this 4D imaging of algal invasion. So this is a, a 3D rendering of, of one of those salamander embryos. And we're showing in these pink spots where the algae are at different parts of the body. And we're doing this across the developmental uh, stages of the embryo so that we can see how do the algae get in and where are they at different time points during salamander development. And that's by a couple of uh, postdocs that are working on that project. Um, and we're doing natural products discovery. So you might know that a lot of the um, antibiotics and drugs that we get are, are derived from bacteria and, and um, defense against pathogens that, that happen when microbes are fighting one another. Um, but another place to look for cool drugs would be uh, mutualist interactions, interactions where two things have, have, um, have adapted or evolved to, to live together. And that's a, a kind of an underexplored region. And since this vertebrate algal endosymbiosis is so unique, uh, we're working with these natural products chemists to help us find the molecules that the algae makes that allows it to interact favorably with the salamander embryo so that it doesn't get killed off. Uh, another cool thing is this egg jelly sunscreen. So uh, there's uh, this postdoc Kwe who's working on, uh, who's just here in Maine, who's working on these different uh, colored eggs. So the ones that are clear, you see where you can see the little balls or the ones that look like little clouds um, have different properties. Both of them, in fact, block UVB. UVB is a very damaging type of uh, UV sun, sunlight. Um, but the, the cloudy eggs block it like nearly completely. So we think that maybe those cloudy eggs have a function in, in UV protection um, for the embryos and maybe the algae too. They can both be damaged by, um, by sunlight. Uh, we're also doing chemical imaging. So I showed you a picture at some point where there is a single cell with algae inside it. So we can take those cells and image the chemicals to see what, what exactly the algae here is spitting out into the, the surrounding cell. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank uh, the Booth Bay Region Land Trust. Uh, so I've gone on to a couple of uh, walks around here. There's some really nice vernal pools at the um, uh, Pine Tree Preserve that have salamander, these salamander eggs in them. And the uh, close here to Bigelow, the uh, Linekin Preserve also has a cool pond with lots of salamanders in it. And really all across the region, they're, they're very common. Uh, and then all these other people that I work with, I, it's a really international uh, project where we're working with lots of different universities and institutions to help, uh, help us better understand this really cool uh, relationship. So I don't know if, if I can take questions now. I would love to, if anybody has them. Yes, that would be great, Dr. Burns. Uh, we do have the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. And to start things up, I did see somebody in the chat shared a little bit of a story, uh, Brenda McGovern. Um, she was sharing that a vernal pool near her home um, started to dry up. And uh, when she left, there was some frogs in there. Uh, let's see what she's saying. I'm just trying to give, give yeah. the overview of this. The green eggs, um, she saw them and um, she could see the salamanders in the eggs. But she had to leave, and when she came back, uh, they were dried up, and it looks like the eggs did not survive. Is there yeah. anything she could have done to help them survive? I mean, <laughs> that happens a lot. So, so around here, especially, I think these uh, spotted salamanders are really particularly abundant, and I've seen them lay their eggs. So, you know, as they're migrating that hundred meters or whatever the, the football field, they'll sometimes lay their eggs in in um, in all kinds of different uh, water bodies. So I've seen them in uh, ATV tracks. If it's deep enough, you know, that's, I think that's all their real cue is. If it's deep enough, they'll lay their eggs. So like an ATV track where they're gonna get run over or it's certainly gonna dry up before, um, before they can hatch. Um, I mean, if you know it's gonna dry up uh, ahead of time, you could transplant them to a different water body uh, and, and they might survive. Uh, they, the strategy that they use is to, you know, they migrate and, and they'll, the reason they lay in different places that aren't necessarily good for them is just so that they can um, uh, 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 expand their um, expand their range a little bit. So you know it's kind of, and they lay hundreds of eggs, right? Each salamander lays seventy something eggs at a time. Um, so the, the reason they do that is because there's a low chance of survival for any one embryo or any even any one egg mass. So uh, if you wanted to help them survive, you could transplant them to a, a different water body. That would be 
The only thing I can think of. Uh, you can raise them inside if you want and then release them uh, into a pool later. It takes them a, a two, three weeks to hatch. And then uh, it's kind of hard to, to, to grow them from there because the salamander, the salamander embryos uh, need to eat living prey. So they, they hunt by eye, uh, at least for the first, I don't know, a couple months. So I've, I've actually ever, never been able to raise them for very long. Uh, can you put them in a lake? Um, you can try, they might get eaten. <laughs> That's the only thing. They, they, might, they might make it or they might get eaten. I'd, I've seen them in, in permanent ponds before, so it's not, it's not unheard of. Uh, QA, very cool science. How does this, so this is from Sandy Neely. How does this essential science get somehow boosted out to the public sphere when developers or logging operations can learn to avoid value of vernal pools? Or, learn to avoid and oh, learn to avoid and value vernal pools. How does the science get from the shelf to the bulldozer? That's a great question, Sandy. Um, I don't know the answer locally, but I, I know uh, we did some work out west uh, and we worked with um, water, what, what were they called? Um, uh, water, they were, they were like reclaim, they were helping reclaim, um, there's special watersheds or, or, or aquatic environments. And one of the things they were doing is restoring um, vernal pools and ponds. And one of the neat things that they, that they said was that they could actually predict uh, exactly how much land they needed to sustain the salamanders that live there. Um, and they were trying to, you know, so these guys have their own company and they're, and they're, they're scientifically minded and they're trying to um, uh, educate developers and, and legislature, legislators, uh, the, like exactly how much room you need to protect these environments. And uh, it's definitely out there. So there's a whole field of environmental science where, where people work with um, legislatures to try to protect things that are critical environments. And vernal pools are definitely kind of uh, environment that are on people's minds because let's say you have a vernal pool, you need to protect, and you wanna protect the salamander population, you need to protect at least 150 meters uh, all around in a radius around it, right? So that's a lot of land. And then if you wanna link, then that'll link up several vernal pools too. So, you know, it's a, it's a tricky equation. Uh, but there are definitely uh, people thinking about it. Great, thank you so much, Dr. John Burns. It doesn't look like we have any more questions at this time. This presentation has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel so that people can watch it again. Um, and I just wanna invite everybody to see more Boothia Region Land Trust events by visiting our website or we post in the newspaper as well as social media. And any closing words for you, Dr. Burns? No, I just want to say thank you again. This is really fun. I, I really enjoy going out onto the uh, preserves. The, the night hike we did was was a great success. We, we actually went to the Linican Preserve because it was a little bit longer. The kids were older and and uh, we saw the, the uh, eggs. We heard the frog calls. We saw some salamanders. It was really, it was really in, enjoyable. So thank you for that too. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Okay. Bye-bye.